Chapter 31 Manon stormed into Parrington's massive war tent, shoving aside the heavy canvas flap so violently that her nails slashed through the material. Why are my thirteen being denied access to the Yellow Legs Coven? Explain. Now. As the last word snapped out of her, Manon stopped dead. Standing in the center of the dim tent, the Duke whirled toward her, his face dark, and Manon had to admit with a thrill, a bit terrifying. Get out, he said, his eyes flaring like embers. But Manon's attention was fixed on what, who, stood behind the Duke. Manon stepped forward, even as the Duke advanced on her. Her black filmy dress like woven night, Caltaine was facing a kneeling, trembling soldier, her pale hand outstretched toward his contorted face. And all over her, an unholy aura of dark fire burned. What is that? Manon said. Out! The Duke barked, and actually had the nerve to lunge for Manon's arm. She swiped with her iron nails, sidestepping the Duke without so much as glancing at him. All her focus, every pore of her, was pinned on the dark-haired lady. The young soldier, one of Parrington's own, was silently sobbing as tendrils of that black fire floated from Caltaine's fingertips and slithered over his skin, leaving no marks. The human turned pain-filled gray eyes to Manon. Please, he mouthed. The duke snatched from Manon again, and she darted past him. Explain this. You do not give orders, wing leader, the duke snapped. Now get out. What is that? Manon repeated. The duke searched for her, but then a silken female voice breathed. Shadowfire. Parrington froze, as if surprised she'd spoken. Where does this shadowfire come from? Manon demanded. The woman was so small, so thin. The dress was barely more than cobwebs and shadows. It was cold in the mountain camp, even for Manon. Had she refused a cloak, or did they just not care? Or perhaps with this fire, perhaps she did not need one at all. From me, Caltaine said, in a voice that was dead and hollow and yet vicious. It has always been there, asleep, and now it has been awoken, shaped anew. What does it do? Manon said. The duke had stopped to observe the young woman, like he was figuring out some sort of puzzle, like he was waiting for something else. Caltaine smiled faintly at the soldier shaking on the ornate red carpet, his golden brown hair shimmering in the light of the dimmed lantern above him. It does this, she whispered, and curled her delicate fingers. The shadow fire shot from her hand and wrapped around the soldier like a second skin. He opened his mouth in a silent scream, convulsing and thrashing, tipping his head back to the ceiling of the tent and sobbing in quiet, unheard agony. But no burns marred his skin, as if the shadow fire summoned only pain, as if it tricked the body into thinking it was being incinerated. Manon didn't take her eyes away from the man spasming on the carpet, tears of blood now leaking from his eyes, his nose, his ears. Quietly, she asked the duke, Why are you torturing him? Is he a rebel spy? Now the duke approached Caltaine, peering at her blank, beautiful face. Her eyes were wholly fixed on the young man, enthralled. She spoke again. No, just a simple man. No inflection, no sign of empathy. Enough, the duke said, and the fire vanished from Caltaine's hand. The young man sagged on the carpet, panting and weeping. The duke pointed to the curtains in the back of the tent, which no doubt concealed a sleeping area. Lie down. Like a doll. Like a ghost. Caltaine turned, that midnight gown swirling with her, and stalked toward the heavy red curtains, slipping through them as if she were no more than mist. The duke walked over to the young man and knelt before him on the ground. The captive lifted his head, blood and tears mingling on his face, but the duke's eyes met Manon's as he put his massive hands on either side of the soldier's face and snapped his neck. The death crunch shuddered through Manon like a twanging of a harp. Normally, she would have chuckled. But for a heartbeat, she felt warm, sticky blue blood on her hands, felt the hilt of her knife imprinted against her palm as she gripped it hard and slashed it across the throat of that croaken. The soldier slumped to the carpet as the duke rose. What is it that you want, Blackbeak? Like the croaken's death, this had been a warning. Keep her mouth shut. But she planned to write her grandmother, planned to tell her everything that had happened. This and the Yellow Legs Coven hadn't been seen or heard from since entering the chamber beneath the keep. The matron would fly down here and start shredding spines. I want to know why we have been blocked from the Yellow Legs Coven. They are under my jurisdiction, and as such, I have the right to see them. It was successful. That's all you need to know. 
you're to tell your guards immediately to grant me and mine permission to enter. Indeed, dozens of guards had blocked her path, and short of killing her way through, Manon had no way in. You choose to ignore my orders. Why should I follow yours, wing leader? You won't have a god's damned army to ride those wyverns if you lock them up for your breeding experiments. They were warriors. They were iron teeth witches. They weren't chattel to be bred. They weren't to be experimented upon. Her grandmother would slaughter him. The duke merely shrugged. I told you I wanted black beaks. You refused to give them to me. Is this punishment? The words snapped out of her. The yellow legs were still iron teeth after Hall, still under her command. Oh no, not at all. But if you disobey my orders again, the next time it might be. He cocked his head, and the light gilded his dark eyes. They are princes, you know, among the Valg. Powerful, cunning princes, capable of splattering people on walls. They've been very keen to test themselves against your kind. Perhaps they'll pay a visit to your barracks, see who survives the night. It'd be a good way to weed out your lesser witches. I have no use for weak soldiers in my armies, even if it decreases your numbers. For a moment, there was a roaring silence in her head. A threat. A threat from this human, this man who had lived but a fraction of her existence, this mortal beast. Careful, a voice said in her head. Proceed with cunning. So Manon allowed herself to nod slightly in acquiescence and asked, And what of your other activities? What goes on beneath the mountains circling this valley? The duke studied her, and she met his gaze, met every inch of blackness within it, and found something slithering inside that had no place in this world. At last, he said, You do not wish to learn what is being bred and forged under those mountains, Black Beak. Don't bother sending your scouts in. They won't see daylight again. Consider yourself warned. The human worm clearly didn't know precisely how skilled her shadows were, but she wasn't about to correct him, not when it could be used to her advantage one day. Yet whatever did go on inside those mountains wasn't her concern, not with the yellow legs and the rest of the legion to deal with. Manon jerked her chin toward the dead soldier. What do you plan to use this shadow fire for? Torture? A flash of ire at yet another question. The duke said tightly, I have not yet decided. For now she will experiment like this. Perhaps later she will learn to incinerate the armies of our enemies. A flame that did not leave burns loosed upon thousands. It would be glorious, even if it was grotesque. And there are armies of enemies gathering. Will you use this shadow fire on them? The duke again cocked his head, the scar on his face thrown into stark contrast in the dim lantern light. Your grandmother didn't tell you, then. About what? She bit out. The duke strode toward the curtain-off part of the room. About the weapons she's been making for me. For you. What weapons? She didn't bother wasting time with tactical silence. The duke just grinned at her as he disappeared, the curtains swinging enough to reveal Caltaine lying on a low bed covered in furs, her thin, pale arms at her sides, her eyes open and unseeing. A shell. A weapon. Two weapons. Caltaine and whatever her grandmother was making. That was why the matron had stayed in the fangs with the other high witches. If the three of them were combining their knowledge, wisdom, and cruelty to develop a weapon to use against mortal armies— a shiver skidded down Manon's spine as she glanced once more at the broken human on the rug. Whatever this new weapon was, whatever the three high witches came up with, the humans wouldn't stand a chance. I want you all spreading the word to the other covens. I want sentinels on constant surveillance at the entrances to the barracks. Three-hour watch rotations, no longer. We don't need anyone passing out and letting the enemy slip in. I've dispatched a letter to the matron already. Elide woke with a jolt inside the airy, warm and rested and not daring to breathe. It was still dark, but the moonlight was gone, dawn far off, and in the blackness she could faintly make out the gleam of a snow-white hair and flicker of a few sets of iron teeth and nails. Oh, gods. She'd planned to sleep for only an hour. She must have slept for at least four. Abraxos didn't move behind her, his wings still shielding her. Since that encounter with Astrin and Manon, every hour, waking or sleeping, had been a nightmare for her lead, and even days afterwards she caught herself holding her breath at odd moments, when the shadow of the fear gripped her by the throat. The witches hadn't bothered with her, even though she'd claimed her blood ran blue, but neither had Vernon. But tonight, she'd been limping back to her room, the stairwell dark and quiet, too quiet, even with the scraping of her chains on the floor, and by her door... A pocket of utter silence, as if even the dust mites had held their breath. Someone was inside her room, 
waiting for her. So she kept walking, all the way to the moonlit airy where her uncle wouldn't dare go. The wyverns of the thirteen had been curled up on the floor like cats or perched on their post over the drop. To her left, Abraxos had watched her from where he'd sprawled on his belly, his depthless eyes unblinking. When she'd come close enough to smell the carrion on his breath, she'd said, I need somewhere to sleep, just for tonight. His tail moved slightly, the iron spikes clinking on the stones, wagging like a dog, sleepy but pleased to see her. There was no growl to be heard, no glint of iron teeth ready to gulp her down in two bites. She would rather be gobbled down than face whoever had been in her room. Elite had slid down against the wall, tucking her hands under her armpits and curling her knees to her chest. Her teeth began clacking against each other, and she curled tighter. It was so cold in here that her breath clouded in front of her. Hay crunched, and Abraxo sidled closer. Elite had tensed, might have sprung to her feet and bolted. The wyvern had extended one wing toward her, as if an invitation, to sit beside him. Please don't eat me, she'd whispered. He'd huffed, as if to say, you wouldn't be much of a mouthful. Shivering, Elide rose. He seemed bigger with every step, but that wing remained extended, as if she were the animal in need of calming. As she reached his side, she could hardly breathe as she extended a hand and stroked the curving, scaly hide. It was surprisingly soft, like worn leather, and toasty, as if he were a furnace. Carefully, aware of the head he angled to watch her every move, she sat down against him, her back instantly warmed. That wing had gracefully lowered, folding down until it became a wall of warm membrane between her and the chill wind. She leaned further into his softness and delightful heat, letting it sink into her bones. She hadn't even realized that she'd tumbled into sleep, and now they were here. Abraxos's reek must be concealing her own human scent, or else the wing leader would have found her by now. Abraxos kept still enough that she wondered if he knew that too. The voices moved toward the center of the airy, and the lead gauged the distance between Abraxos and the door. Perhaps she could slip away before they noticed. Keep it quiet, keep it secret. If anyone reveals our defenses, they die at my hand. As you will it, Sorrel said. Astrin said, do we tell the yellow legs and blue bloods? No, Manon said, her voice like death and bloodshed. Blackbeaks only. Even if another coven winds up volunteering for the next round, Astrin said. Manon gave a snarl that made the hair on Elite's neck rise. We can only tug so much at the leash. Leashes can snap, Astrin challenged. So can your neck, Manon said. Now, now while they were fighting... Abraxos remained unmoving, as if not daring to draw attention to himself while Elide prepared to hurry out. But the chains. Elide sat back down and carefully, slowly lifted her foot just a little off the floor, holding the chains so they wouldn't drag. With one foot and one hand, she began pushing herself across the stones, sliding for the door. This shadow fire, Sorrel mused, as if trying to diffuse the brewing storm between the wing leader and her cousin. Will he use it on us? He seemed inclined to think that it could be used on an entire armies. I wouldn't put it past him to hold it over our heads. Closer and closer, a lead edged for the open doorway. She was almost there when Manon crooned. If you had any backbone, a lead, you would have stayed beside Abraxos until we left. Chapter 32 Manon had spotted a lead sleeping against Abraxos the moment they'd entered the airy, and she'd become aware of her presence moments before that, tracking her scent alone up the stairs. If Astrin and Sorrel had noticed, they'd made no comment. The servant girl was sitting on her ass, almost to the doorway, one foot in the air to keep her chains from dragging. Smart, even if she'd been too stupid to realize how well they saw in the dark. There was someone in my room, Elite said, lowering her foot and standing. Astrin stiffened. Who? I don't know, Elite said, keeping near the doorway, even if it would do her no good. It didn't seem wise to go inside. Abraxos had tensed, his tail shifting over the stones. The useless beast would have worried for the girl. Manon narrowed her eyes at him. Isn't your kind supposed to eat, young woman? He glared at her. Elide held her ground as Manon prowled closer, and Manon, despite herself, was impressed. She looked at the girl, really looked at her. A girl who was not afraid to sleep against a wyvern, who had enough common sense to tell when danger might be approaching. Perhaps that blood really did run blue. 
There is a chamber beneath this castle, Manon said, and Astrin and Sorrel fell into rank behind her. Inside, it is a coven of yellow legs, witches, all taken by the duke to create demon offspring. I want you to get into that chamber. I want you to tell me what's happening in there. The human went pale as death. I can't. You can and you will, Manon said. You're mine now. She felt Astrin's attention on her, the disapproval and surprise. Manon went on. You find a way into that chamber and you give me the details. You keep quiet about what you learn and you live. If you betray me, if you tell anyone, then we'll toast you at your wedding party to a handsome Valk husband, I suppose. The girl's hands were shaking. Manon smacked them down to her sides. We do not tolerate cowards in the Blackbeak ranks, she hissed. Or did you think my protection was free? Manon pointed to the door. You're to stay in my chambers if your own are compromised. Go way to the bottom of the stairs. Elide glanced behind Manon to her second and third, as if she was considering begging them to help. But Manon knew that their faces were stony and unyielding. Elide's terror was a tang in Manon's nose as she limped away. It took her far too long to get down the stairs, that wasted leg of hers slowing her to a crone's pace. When she was at the bottom, Manon turned to Sorrel and Astrin. She could go to the Duke, Sorrel said. As second, she had the right to make that remark, to think through all threats to the air. She's not that ruthless. Astrin clicked her tongue. That was why you spoke, knowing she was here. Manon didn't bother nodding. If she's caught? Astrin asked. Sorrel glanced sharply at her. Manon didn't feel like reprimanding. It was on Sorrel to sort out the dominance between them now. If she's caught, then we'll find another way. And you have no qualms about them killing her, or using that shadow fire on her? Stand down, Astrin. Sorrel ground out. Astrin did no such thing. You should be asking these questions, second. Sorrel's iron teeth snapped down. It is because of your questioning that you are now third. Enough, Manon said. Elite is the only one who might get into that chamber and report. The Duke has his grunts under orders not to let a single witch near. Even the shadows can't get close enough. But a servant girl? Cleaning up whatever mess? You were the one waiting in her room, Astrin said. A dose of fear goes a long way in humans. Is she human, though? Sorrel asked. Or do we count her among us? It makes no difference if she's human or which kind. I'd send whoever was the most qualified down into those chambers, and at the moment, only a lead can gain access to them. Cunning. That was how she would get around the Duke, with his schemes and his weapons. She might work for his king, but she would not tolerate being left ignorant. I need to know what's happening in those chambers, Manon said. If we lose one life to do that, then so be it. And what then? Astrin asked, despite Sorrel's warning. Once you learn, what then? Manon hadn't decided. Again, that phantom blood coated her hands. Follow orders, or else she and the Thirteen would be executed, either by her grandmother or by the Duke. After her grandmother read her letter, maybe it would be different, but until then... Then we continue as we've been commanded, Manon said, but I will not be led into this with a blindfold over my eyes. Spy. A spy for the wing leader? Elide supposed it was no different than being a spy for herself, for her own freedom. But learning about the supply wagon's arrival and trying to get into that chamber while also going about her duties, maybe she would get lucky. Maybe she could do both. Manon had a pallet of hay brought to her room, setting it near the fire to warm Elide's mortal bones, she'd said. Elide hardly slept the first night in the witch's tower. When she stood to use the privy, convinced that the witch was asleep, she'd made it two steps before Manon said, Going somewhere? gods, her voice, like a snake hidden up a tree. She'd stammered out an explanation about needing the bathing room. When Manon hadn't replied, Elite had stumbled out. She'd returned to find the witch asleep, or at least her eyes were closed. Manon slept naked, even with the chill. Her white hair cascaded down her back, and there wasn't a part of the witch that didn't seem lean with muscle or flecked with faint scarring. No part that wasn't a reminder of what Manon would do to her if she failed. Three days later, Elide made her move. The exhaustion that had tugged relentlessly on her vanished as she clutched the armful of linen she'd taken from the laundry and peered down the hallway. Four guards stood at the door of the stairwell. It had taken her three days of helping in the laundry, three days of chatting up the laundresses to learn if linens were ever needed in the chamber at the bottom of those stairs. No one had wanted to talk to her the first two days. They'd just eyed her and told her where to haul things or when to singe her hands or when to scrub until her back hurt. But yesterday, 
Yesterday she had seen the torn, blood-soaked clothes come in. Blue blood, not red. Witch blood. Elide kept her head down, working on the soldier's shirt she'd been given once she'd proved her skill with a needle. But she noted which laundresses intercept the clothes, and then she kept working through the hours it took to clean and dry and press them, staying later than most of the others, waiting. She was nobody and nothing and belonged to no one, but if she let Manon and the Black Beaks think she accepted their claim on her, she might very well still get free once those wagons arrived. The Black Beaks didn't care about her. Not really. Her heritage was convenient for them. She doubted they would notice when she vanished. She'd been a ghost for years now anyway, her heart full of the forgotten dead. So she worked and waited. Even when her back was aching, even when her hands were so sore they shook, she marked the laundress who hauled the pressed clothes out of the chamber and vanished. Elide memorized every detail of her face, of her build and height. No one noticed when she slipped out after her, carrying an armful of linens for the wing leader. No one stopped her as she trailed the laundress down hall after hall until she reached this spot. Elide peered down the hall again, just as the laundress came up out of the stairwell, arms empty, face drawn and bloodless. The guards didn't stop her. Good. The laundress turned down another hall, and Elide loosed a breath she'd been holding. Turning toward Manon's tower, she silently thought through her plan over and over. If she was caught. Perhaps she should throw herself from one of the balconies rather than face the dozens of awful deaths awaiting her. No. No. She would endure. She had survived when so many, nearly everyone she'd loved, had not, when her kingdom had not, so she would survive for them, and when she left, she would build herself a new life far away in their honor. Elide hobbled up a winding stairwell. God, she hated stairs. She was about halfway up when she heard a man's voice that stopped her cold. The Duke said you spoke. Why will you not say a word to me? Vernon. Silence greeted him. Back down the stairs. She should go right back down the stairs. So beautiful, her uncle murmured to whoever it was, like a moonless night. Elide's mouth went dry at the tone in his voice. Perhaps it's fate that we ran into each other here. He watches you so closely. Vernon paused. Together, he said quietly, reverently. Together we shall create wonders that will make the world tremble. Such dark, intimate words filled with such entitlements. She didn't want to know what he meant. Elide took as silent a step as she could down the stairs. She had to get away. Caltaine, her uncle rumbled, a demand and a threat and a promise. The silent young woman, the one who never spoke, who never looked at anything, who had such marks on her. Elide had seen her only a few times, had seen how little she responded or fought back. And then Elide was walking up the stairs up and up, making sure her chains clanked as loudly as possible. Her uncle fell silent. She rounded the next landing, and there they were. Caltaine had been shoved up against the wall, the neck of that too flimsy gown tugged to the side, her breast nearly out. There was such emptiness on her face, as if she weren't even there at all. Vernon stood a few paces away. Elide clutched her linen so hard she thought she'd shred them. Wish she had those iron nails for once. Lady Caltaine, she said to the young woman, barely a few years older than she. She did not expect her own rage, did not expect herself to go on to say, I was sent to find you, lady. This way, please. Who sent for her? Vernon demanded. Elide met his gaze and did not bow her head, not an inch. The wing leader. The wing leader isn't authorized to meet with her. And you are? Elide set herself between them, though it would do no good should her uncle decide to use force. Vernon smiled. I was wondering when you'd show your fangs, Elide, or should I say your iron teeth? He knew, then. Elide stared him down and put a light hand on Caltaine's arm. She was cold as ice. She didn't even look at Elide. If you'd be so kind, lady, Elide said, tugging on that arm, clutching the laundry with her other hand. Caltaine mutely started into a walk. Vernon chuckled. You two could be sisters, he said casually. Fascinating, Elide said guiding the lady up the steps, even as the effort to keep balance made her leg throb in agony. Until next time, her uncle said from behind them, and she didn't want to know who he meant. In silence, her heart pounding so wildly that she thought she might vomit, Elide led Caltaine up to the next landing and let go of her long enough to open the door and guide her into the hall. The lady paused, staring at the stone, at nothing. Where do you need to go? 
Elite asked her softly. The lady just stared. In the torchlight, the scar on her arm was gruesome. Who had done that? Elite put a hand on the woman's elbow again. Where can I take you that is safe? Nowhere. There was nowhere here that was safe. But slowly, as if it took her a lifetime to remember how to do it, the lady slid her eyes to a lead. Darkness and death and black flame, despair and rage and emptiness, and yet, a kernel of understanding. Cultane merely walked away, that dress hissing on the stones. There were bruises that looked like fingerprints around the other arm, as if someone had gripped her too hard. This place, these people... Alid fought her nausea, watching until the woman vanished around a corner. Manon was seated at her desk, staring at what appeared to be a letter when Alid entered the tower. Did you get into the chamber? The witch said, not bothering to turn around. Alid swallowed hard. I need you to get me some poison. Chapter 33 Standing in a wide clearing among the stacks of crates, Adian blinked at the late morning sun slanting through the windows high up in the warehouse. He was already sweating and in dire need of water as the heat of the day turned the warehouse suffocating. He didn't complain. He'd demanded to be allowed to help, and Aelin had refused. He'd insisted he was fit to fight, and she had merely said, Prove it. So here they were. He and the Fae Prince had been going through a workout routine with sparring sticks for the past 30 minutes, and it was thoroughly kicking his ass. The wound on his side was one wrong move away from splitting, but he gritted through it. The pain was welcome, considering the thoughts that had kept him up all night, that Roe and Evelyn had never told him, that his mother had died to conceal the knowledge of who'd sired him, that he was half fae, and that he might not know for another decade how he would age, if he would outlast his queen. And his father, Gavriel, that was a whole other path to be explored. Later. Perhaps it'd be useful if Maeve made good on the threat she posed now that one of his father's legendary's companion was hunting Aelin in the city. Lorcan. Shit, the stories he'd heard about Lorcan had been full of glory and gore, mostly the latter. A male who didn't make mistakes, and who was ruthless with those who did. Dealing with the King of Adarlan had been bad enough, but having an immortal enemy at their backs? Shit. And if Maeve ever saw fit to send Gavriel over here? Adian would find a way to endure it, as he'd found a way to endure everything in his life. Adian was finishing a maneuver with the stick that the prince had shown him twice now when Aelin paused her own exercising. I think that's enough for today, she said, barely winded. Adian stiffened at the dismissal already in her eyes. He'd been waiting all morning for this. For the past ten years, he'd learned everything he could from mortals. If warriors came to this territory... He'd use his considerable charms to convince them to teach him what they knew, and whenever he'd ventured outside of his lands, he'd made a good point to glean as much as he could about fighting and killing from whoever lived there. So pitting himself against a purebred fey warrior, direct from Dornell, was an opportunity he couldn't waste. He couldn't let his cousin's pity wreck it. I heard a story, Adian drawled to Rowan, that you killed an enemy warlord using a table. Please, Aelin said. Who the hell told you that? Quinn. Your uncle's captain of the guard. He was an admirer of Prince Rowan's. He knew all the stories. Aelin slid her eyes to Rowan, who smirked, bracing his sparring stick on the floor. You can't be serious, she said. What, you squashed him to death like a pressed grape? Rowan choked. No, I didn't squash him like a grape. He gave the queen a feral smile. I ripped the leg of the table off and impaled him with it. Clean through the chest and into the stone wall, Adian said. Well, said Aelin, snorting, I'll give you points for resourcefulness, at least. Adian rolled his neck. Let's get back to it. But Aelin gave Rowan a look that pretty much said, don't kill my cousin, please. Call it off. Adian gripped the wooden sparring stick tighter. I'm fine. A week ago, Aelin said, you had one foot in the afterworld. Your wound is still healing. We're done for the day, and you're not coming out. I know my limits, and I say I'm fine. Rowan's slow grin was nothing short of lethal. An invitation to dance. And that primal part of Adian decided it didn't want to flee from the predator in Rowan's eyes. No, it very much wanted to stand its ground and roar back. Aelin groaned, but kept her distance. Prove it, she'd said. Well, he would. Adian gave no warning as he attacked, fainting right and aiming low. He'd killed men with that move, sliced them clean in half. But Rowan dodged him with brutal efficiency, deflecting and positioning to the offensive, and that was all that Adian managed to see before he'd brought up his stick on pure instinct, 
Bracing himself against the force of Rowan's blow had his side bleeding in pain, but he kept focus, even though Rowan had almost knocked the stick from his hands. He managed to strike the next blow himself, but as Rowan's lips tugged upward, Adian had the feeling that the prince was toying with him. Not for amusement. No, to prove some point. Red mist coated his vision. Rowan went to sweep his legs out, and Adian stomped hard enough on Rowan's stick that it snapped in two. As it did, Adian twisted, lunging to bring his own stick straight into Rowan's face. Gripping the two pieces on either hand, the fey warrior dodged going low and Adian didn't see the second blow coming to his legs. Then he was blinking at the wooden beams of the ceiling, gasping for breath as the pain from his wound arced through his side. Rowan snarled down at him. One piece of the stick angled to cut his throat while the other pushed against his abdomen, ready to spill his guts. Holy burning hell. Adian had known he'd be fast and strong, but this... Having Rowan fight alongside the Bane might very well decide battles in any sort of war. Gods, his side hurt badly enough that he thought he might be bleeding. The Fey Prince spoke so quietly that even Aelin couldn't hear. Your queen gave you an order to stop, for your own good, because she needs you healthy, and because it pains her to see you injured. Do not ignore her command next time. Adian was wise enough not to snap a retort, nor to move as the prince dug in the tips of his sticks a little harder. And, Rowan added, if you ever speak to her again the way you did last night, I'll rip out your tongue and shove it down your throat, understand? With the stick at his neck, Adian couldn't nod without impaling himself on the jagged end, but he breathed. Understood, prince. Adian opened his mouth again as Rowan backed away, about to say something that he would surely regret, when a bright hello sounded. They all whirled, weapons up, as Lysandra closed the rolling door behind her, boxes and bags in her arms. She had an uncanny way of sneaking into places unnoticed. Lysandra took two steps, that stunning face grave, and stopped dead as she beheld Rowan. Then his queen was suddenly moving, snatching some of the bags from Lysandra's arms and steering her into the apartment a level above. Adian eased from where he'd been sprawled on the ground. Is that Lysandra? Rowan asked. Not too bad on the eyes, is she? Rowan snorted. Why is she here? Adian gingerly prodded the wound at his side, making sure it was indeed intact. She probably has information about Arabin, whom Adian would soon begin hunting once his god's damned wound was finally healed, regardless of whether Aelin deemed him fit. And then he cut the King of Assassins into tiny little pieces over many, many days. Yet she doesn't want you to hear it? Adian said, I think she finds everyone but Aelin boring. Biggest disappointment of my life. A lie, and he didn't know why he'd said it. But Rowan smiled a bit. I'm glad she found a female friend. Adian marveled for a heartbeat at the softness in the warrior's face, until Rowan shifted his eyes toward him and they were full of ice. Aelin's court will be a new one, different from any other in the world, where the old ways are honored again. You're going to learn them, and I'm going to teach you. I know the old ways. You're going to learn them again. Adian's shoulders pushed back as he rose to his full height. I'm the general of the Bane, and a prince of both the Eshriver and Galathinius houses. I'm not some untrained foot soldier. Rowan gave a sharp nod of agreement, and Adian supposed he should be flattered. Until Rowan said, My cadre, as Aelin likes to call them, was a lethal unit because we stuck together and abided by the same code. Maeve might be a sadist, but she ensured that we all understood and followed it. Aelin would never force us into anything, and our code will be different, better than Maeve's. You and I are going to form the backbone of this court. We will shape and decide our own code. What? Obedience and blind loyalty? He didn't feel like getting a lecture. Even if Rowan was right, and every word out of the prince's mouth was one that Adian had dreamed of hearing for a decade, he should have been the one to initiate this conversation. Gods above, he'd had this conversation with Ren weeks ago. Rowan's eyes glittered. To protect and serve. Aelin? He could do that. He'd already planned on doing that. Aelin, and each other, and Terrison. No room for argument, no hint of a doubt. A small part of Adian understood why his cousin had offered the prince the blood oath. Who is that? Lysandra said too innocently as Aelin escorted her up the stairs. Rowan, Aelin said, kicking open the apartment door. He's spectacularly built, she mused. I've never been with a fey male, or female for that matter. Aelin shook her head to try to clear the image from her mind. He's... She swallowed. Lysandra was grinning, and Aelin hissed, setting down the bags on the great room floor and shutting the door. Stop that. Hmm, was all Lysandra said, dropping her boxes and bags beside Aelin's. Well, I have two things. One, Nazrin sent me a note this morning saying that you had a new, very muscled guest staying, and to bring some clothes. 
so I brought clothes. Looking at our guest, I think Nezrin undersold him a good deal, so the clothes might be tight. Not that I'm objecting to that one bit, but he can use them until you get others. Thank you, she said, and Lysander waved a slender hand. She'd thank Felique later. The other thing I brought you is news. Arabin received a report last night that the two prison wagons were spotted heading south to Marath, chock full of those missing people. She wondered if Kaol knew, and if he had tried to stop it. Does he know that former magic wielders are being targeted? A nod. He's been tracking which people disappear and which get sent south in the prison wagons. He's looking into all his clients' lineages now, no matter how the families tried to conceal their histories after magic was banned, to see if he can use anything to his advantage. It's something to consider when dealing with him, given your talents. Aelin chewed on her lip. Thank you for telling me that, too. Fantastic. Arabin, Lorcan, the King, the Valg, the Key, Dorian. She had a half a mind to stuff her face with every remaining morsel of food in the kitchen. Just prepare yourself, Lysander glanced at the small pocket watch. I need to go. I have a lunch appointment. No doubt why Evangeline wasn't with her. She was almost to the door when Aelin said, How much longer? Until you're free of your debts. I still have a great deal to pay off, so a while. Lysander paced a few steps, then caught herself. Clarice keeps adding money as Evangeline grows, claiming that someone so beautiful would have made her double, triple what she originally told me. That's despicable. What can I do? Lysander held up her wrist, where the tattoo had been inked. She'll hunt me until the day I die, and I can't run with Evangeline. I could dig Clarice a grave no one would ever discover, Aelin said, and meant it. Lysander knew she meant it, too. Not yet. Not now. You say the word, and it's done. Lysander's smile was a thing of savage, dark beauty. Standing before a crate in the carnivorous warehouse, Kaol studied the map Aelin had just handed him. He focused on the blank spots, trying not to stare at the warrior prince on guard by the door. It was hard to avoid doing so when Rowan's presence somehow seemed to suck out all the air in the warehouse. Then there was the matter of the delicately pointed ears peeking out from the short silver hair. Fay. He'd never seen one other than Aelin in those brief, petrifying moments. And Rowan, conveniently in all her storytelling, Aelin had forgotten to mention that the prince was so handsome. A handsome fey prince, whom she'd spent months living and training with, while Kaol's own life fell apart, while people died because of her actions. Rowan was watching Kaol as if he might be dinner. Depending on his fey form, that might not be too far wrong. Every instinct was screaming at him to run, despite the fact that Rowan had been nothing but polite. Distant and intense, but polite. Still, Kaol didn't need to see the prince in action to know that he would be dead before he could even draw his sword. You know, he won't bite, Aelin crooned. Kaol leveled a stare at her. Can you just explain what these maps are for? Anything you, Ress, or Brulo can fill in regarding these gaps in the castle's defenses would be appreciated, she said. Not an answer. There was no sign of Adian among the stacked crates, but the general was probably listening from somewhere nearby with his keen fey hearing. For you to bring down the clock tower? Kaol asked, folding up the map and tucking it into the inner pocket of his tunic. Maybe, she said. He tried not to bristle. But there was something settled about her now, as if some invisible tension in her face had vanished. He tried not to look toward the door again. I haven't heard from Ress or Brulo for a few days, he said instead. I'll make contact soon. She nodded, pulling out a second map, this one of the labyrinth network of the sewers, and weighted down the ends with whatever small blade she had on her. A good number of them, apparently. Arabin learned that the missing prisoners were taken to Marath last night. Did you know? Another failure that fell on his shoulders. Another disaster. No. They can't have gotten far. You could gather a team and ambush the wagons. I know I could. Are you going to? He laid a hand on the map. Did you bring me here to prove a point about my uselessness? She straightened. I asked you to come because I thought it would be helpful for the both of us. We're both... We're both under a fair amount of pressure these days. Her turquoise and gold eyes were calm, unfazed. Kaol said, When do you make your move? Soon. Again, not an answer. He said as evenly as he could, Anything else I should know? I'd start avoiding the sewers. It's your death warrant if you don't. There are people trapped down there. We've found the nests, but no sign of the prisoners. I won't abandon them. That's all well and good, she said, and he clenched his teeth at the dismissal in her tone. But there are things worse than Val grunts patrolling in the sewers, and I bet they won't turn a blind eye to anyone in their territory. I would weigh the risks if I were you. She dragged a hand through her hair. 
So are you going to ambush the prison wagons? Of course I am. Even though the rebels' numbers were down, so many of their people were either fleeing the city altogether or refusing to risk their necks in an increasingly futile battle. Was that concern flickering in her eyes? But she said, They use warded locks on the wagons, and the doors are reinforced with iron. Bring the right tools. He drew in a breath to snap about her talking down to him, but she would know about the wagons. She'd spent weeks in one. He couldn't quite meet her stare as he straightened up to go. Tell Felique that Prince Rowan says thank you for the clothes, Aelin said. What the hell was she talking about? Perhaps it was another jab. So he made for the door, where Rowan stepped aside with a murmured farewell. Nezrin had told him she'd spent the evening with Adian and Aelin, but he hadn't realized they might be... friends. He hadn't considered that Nezrin might wind up unable to resist the allure of Aelin Galathinius. Though we suppose that Aelin was a queen. She did not falter. She did not do anything but plow ahead, burning bright, even if it meant killing Dorian. They hadn't spoken of it since the day of Adian's rescue, but it still hung between them. And when she went to free magic, Kale again would have the proper precautions in place, because he did not think she would put her sword down the next time. Chapter 34 Aelin knew she had things to do, vital things, terrible things, but she could sacrifice one day. Keeping to the shadows whenever possible, she spent the afternoon showing Rowan the city, from the elegant residential districts to the markets crammed with vendors selling goods for the summer solstice in two weeks. There was no sign or scent of Lorcan, thanks the gods, but the king's men were posted at a few busy intersections, giving Aelin an opportunity to point them out to Rowan. He studied them with trained efficiency, his keen sense of smell enabling him to pick out which ones were still human and which were inhabited by lesser Valg demons. From the look on his face, she honestly felt a little bad for any guard that came across him, demon or human. A little, but not much, especially given that their presence alone somewhat ruined her plans for a peaceful, quiet day. She wanted to show Rowan the good parts of the city before dragging him into its underbelly. So she took him to one of Nezrin's family's bakeries, where she went so far as to buy a few of those pear tarts. At the docks, Rowan even convinced her to try some pan-fried trout. She'd once sworn never to eat fish, and I cringed as the fork had neared her mouth. But the damn thing was delicious. She ate her entire fish, then snuck bites of Rowan's to his snarling dismay. Here. Rowan was here with her, in Rifthold, and there was so much more she wanted him to see, to learn about what her life had been like. She'd never wanted to share any of it before. Even when she'd heard the crack of a whip later after lunch as they cooled themselves by the water, she'd wanted him with her to witness it. He'd silently stood with a hand on her shoulder as they watched the cluster of chained slaves hauling cargo onto one of the ships, watched, and could do nothing. Soon, she promised herself. Putting an end to that was a high priority. They meandered back through the market stalls, one after another, until the smell of roses and lilies wafted by. The river breeze sweeping petals of every shape and color past their feet as the flower girls shouted about their wares. She turned to him. If you were a gentleman, you'd buy me. Rowan's face had gone blank, his eyes hollow as he stared at one of the flower girls in the center of the square, a basket of hothouse peonies on her thin arm. Young, pretty, dark-haired, and oh gods. She shouldn't have brought him here. Lyria had sold flowers in the market. She'd been a poor flower girl before Prince Rowan had spotted her and had instantly known she was his mate. A fairy tale, until she'd been slaughtered by enemy forces, pregnant with Rowan's child. Aelin clenched and unclenched her fingers, any words lodged in her throat. Rowan was still staring at the girl, who smiled at a passing woman, aglow with some inner light. I didn't deserve her. Rowan said quietly. Aelin swallowed hard. There were wounds in both of them that had yet to heal, but this one. Truth, as always, she could offer him one truth in exchange for another. I didn't deserve Sam. He looked at her at last. She'd do anything to get rid of the agony in his eyes. Anything. His gloved fingers brushed her own, then dropped back to his side. She clenched her hand in a fist again. Come, I want to show you something. Aelin scrounged up some dessert from the street vendors while Rowan waited in the shadowed alley. Now, sitting in one of the wooden rafters in the gilded dome of the darkened royal theater, Aelin munched on a lemon cookie and swung her legs in the open air below. The space was the same as she remembered it, but the silence, the darkness. This used to be my favorite place in the entire world, she said, her words too loud in the emptiness. Sunlight poured in from the roof door they'd broken into, illuminating the rafters in the golden dome, 
gleaming faintly off the polished brass banisters and the blood-red curtains of the stage below. Arabin owns a private box, so I went any chance I could. The nights I didn't feel like dressing up or being seen, or maybe the nights I had a job and only an hour free, I'd creep in here through that door and listen. Rowan finished his cookie and gazed at the dark space below. He'd been so quiet for the past 30 minutes, as if he'd pulled back into a place where she couldn't reach him. She nearly sighed with relief as he said, I've never seen an orchestra, or a theater like this, crafted around sound and luxury. Even in Doranel, the theaters and amphitheaters are ancient, with benches or just steps. There's no places like this anywhere, perhaps, even in Terrison. Then you'll have to build one. With what money? You think people are going to be happy to starve while I build a theater for my own pleasure? Perhaps not right away, but if you believe one would benefit the city, the country, then do it. Artists are essential. Florine had said as much. Aelin sighed. This place has been shut down for months, and yet I swear I can still hear the music floating in the air. Rowan angled his head, studying the dark with those immortal senses. Perhaps the music does live on, in some form. The thought made her eyes sting. I wish you could have heard it. I wish you could have been here to hear Peter conduct the Stygian suite. Sometimes I feel like I'm still sitting down in that box, thirteen years old and weeping from the sheer glory of it. You cried? She could almost see the memories of their training this spring flashing in his eyes. All those times music had calmed or unleashed her magic. It was part of her soul, as much as he was. The final movement. Every damn time. I would go back to the keep and have the music in my mind for days, even as I trained, or killed, or slept. It was a kind of madness loving that music. It was why I started playing the pianoforte, so I could come home at night and make my poor attempt at replicating it. She'd never told anyone that never taken anyone here either. Rowan said, is there a pianoforte here? I haven't played in months and months, and this is a horrible idea for about a dozen different reasons, she said for the tenth time as she finished rolling back the curtains on the stage. She'd stood here before, when Arabin's patronage had earned them invitations to galas held on the stage for the sheer thrill of walking on sacred space. But now, amid the gloom of the dead theater, lit with a single candle Rowan had found, it felt like standing in a tomb. The chairs of the orchestra were still arranged as they probably had been the night the musicians had walked out to protest the massacres in Andovir and Calcutta. They were all still unaccounted for, and considering the array of miseries the king now heaped upon the world, death would have been the kindest option. Clenching her jaw, Aelin leashed the familiar, writhing anger. Rowan was standing beside the pianoforte near the front of the stage, running a hand over the smooth surface as if it were a prize horse. She hesitated before the magnificent instrument. It seems like sacrilege to play that thing, she said, the word echoing loudly in the space. Since when are you the religious type anyway? Rowan gave her a crooked smile. Where should I stand to best hear it? You might be in for a lot of pain at first. Self-conscious today, too? If Lorcan's snooping about, she grumbled. I'd rather he not report back to Maeve that I'm a lousy at playing. She pointed to a spot on the stage. There. Stand there and stop talking, you insufferable bastard. He chuckled and moved to the spot she'd indicated. She swallowed as she slid onto the smooth bench and folded back the lid, revealing the gleaming white and black keys beneath. She positioned her feet on the pedals, but made no move to touch the keyboard. I haven't played since before Nehemia died, she admitted, the words too heavy. We can come back another day if you want. A gentle, steady offer. His silver hair glimmered in the dim candlelight. There might not be another day, and and I would consider my life very sad indeed if I never played again. He nodded and crossed his arms. A silent order. She faced the keys and slowly set her hands on the ivory. It was smooth and cool and waiting, a great beast of sound and joy about to be awakened. I need to warm up. She blurted and plunged in without another word, playing as softly as she could. Once she had started seeing the notes in her mind again, when muscle memory had her fingers reaching for those familiar chords, she began. It was not the sorrowful, lovely piece she had once played for Dorian, and it was not the light, dancing melodies she'd played for sport. It was not the complex and clever pieces that she had played for Nehemia and Kaol. This piece was a celebration, a reaffirmation of life, of glory, of the pain and beauty in breathing. Perhaps that was why she'd gone to hear it performed every year, after so much killing and torture and punishment, as a reminder of what she was, of what she struggled to keep. Up and up it built, 
the sound breaking from the piano forte like the heart song of a god, until Rowan drifted over to stand beside the instrument, until she whispered to him, now, and the crescendo shattered into the world, note after note after note. The music crashed around them, roaring through the emptiness of the theater. The hollow silence that had been inside her for so many months now overflowed with sound. She brought the piece home to its final explosive, triumphant chord. And when she looked up, panting slightly, Rowan's eyes were lined with silver, his throat bobbing. Somehow, after all this time, her warrior prince still managed to surprise her. He seemed to struggle for words, but he finally breathed. Show me. Show me how you did that. So she obliged him. They spent the better part of an hour seated together on the bench, Aelin teaching him the basics of the pianoforte, explaining the sharps and flats, the pedals, the notes and chords. When Rowan heard someone at last coming to investigate the music, they slipped out. She stopped at the Royal Bank, warning Rowan to wait in the shadows across the street as she again sat in the master's office while one of his underlings rushed in and out on her business. She eventually left with another bag of gold, vital now that there was one more mouth to feed and body to clothe, and found Rowan exactly where she'd left him, pissed off that she'd refused to let him accompany her. But he'd raised too many questions. So you're using your own money to support us? Rowan asked as they slipped down the side street. A flock of beautifully dressed young women passed by on the sunny avenue beyond the alley and gaped at the hooded, powerfully built male who stormed past, and then all turned to admire the view from behind. Aelin flashed her teeth at them. For now, she said to him, and what will you do for money later? She glanced sidelong at him. It'll be taken care of. By whom? Me? Explain? You'll find out soon enough. She gave him a little smile that she knew drove him insane. Rowan made to grab her by the shoulder, but she ducked away from his touch. Ah, ah, better not move too swiftly or someone might notice. He snarled, the sound definitely not human, and she chuckled. Annoyance was better than guilt and grief. Just be patient and don't get your feathers ruffled. Chapter 35 Gods, he hated the smell of their blood. But damn if it wasn't a glorious thing to be covered in when two dozen Valg lay dead around him and good people were finally safe. Drenched in Valg blood from head to toe, Kaol Westfall searched for a clean bit of fabric with which to wipe down his black-stained blade, but came up empty. Across the hidden clearing, Nezrin was doing the same. He'd killed four. She'd taken down seven. Kaol knew only because he'd been watching her the entire time. She'd paired off with someone else during the ambush. He'd apologized for snapping at her the other night, but she just nodded, and still teamed up with another rebel. But now, she gave up trying to wipe down her blade and looked toward him. Her midnight eyes were bright, and even with her face splattered in black blood, her smile, relieved, a bit wild with the thrill of their fight, their victory, was beautiful. The word clanged through him. Kaol frowned, and the expression was instantly wiped from her face. His mind was always a jumble after a fight, as if it had been spun around and around and twisted upside down, and then given a heavy dose of liquor. But he strode toward her. They'd done this. Together. They'd saved these people more at once than they'd ever rescued before, and with no loss of life beyond the Valg. Gore and blood were splattered on the grassy forest floor, the only remnants of the decapitated Valg bodies that had already been hauled away and dumped behind a boulder. When they left, they'd pay the bodies as former owners the tribute of burning them. Three of his group had set to unchaining the huddled prisoners now seated in the grass. The Valg bastards had stuffed so many of them into the two wagons that Kale had nearly gagged at the smell. Each wagon had only a small barred window high up on the wall, and a man had fainted inside, but all of them were safe now. He wouldn't stop until the others still hidden in the city were out of harm's way as well. A woman reached up with her filthy hands, her nails split and fingertips swollen as if she tried to claw her way out of whatever hellhole she'd been kept in. Thank you, she whispered, her voice hoarse, probably from screaming that had gone unanswered. Kale's throat tightened as he gave the woman's hand a gentle squeeze, mindful of her near-broken fingers, and stepped to where Nezrin was now wiping her blade on the grass. You fought well, he told her. I know I did. Nezrin looked over her shoulder at him. We need to get them to the river. The boats won't wait forever. Fine, he didn't expect warmth or camaraderie after a battle, despite that smile, but maybe once we're back in Rifthold, we can go for a drink. He needed one. Badly. Nezrin rose from her crouch, and he fought the urge to wipe a spatter of blood from her tan cheek. The hair she'd tied back had come loose, and the warm forest breeze set the strands floating past her face. 
I thought we were friends, she said. We are friends, he said carefully. Friends don't spend time with each other only when they're feeling sorry for themselves, or bite each other's heads off for asking difficult questions. I told you I was sorry for snapping at you the other night. She sheathed her blade. I'm fine with distracting each other for whatever reason, Kale, but let's at least be honest about it. He opened his mouth to object, but maybe she was right. I do like your company, he said. I wanted to go for a drink to celebrate, not brood, and I'd like to go with you. She pursed her lips. That was the most half ass attempt at flattery I've ever heard, but fine, I'll join you. The worst part was that she didn't even sound mad. She genuinely meant it. He could go drinking with or without her, and she wouldn't particularly care. The thought didn't sit well. Personal conversation decidedly over, Nezrin surveyed the clearing, the wagon, and the carnage. Why now? The king has had ten years to do this. Why the sudden rush to get these people all down to Marath? What's it building to? Some of the rebels turned their way. Kael studied the bloody aftermath as if it were a map. Aelin Galathinius's return might have started it, Kael said, aware of those who'd listened. No, Nezrin said simply. Aelin announced herself barely two months ago. Something this large? It's been in the works for a long, long time. Sen, one of the leaders with whom Kael met regularly, said, We should consider yielding the city. Move to other places where their foothold isn't as secure. Maybe try to establish a border somehow. If Aelin Galathinius is lingering near Rifthold, we should meet with her. Maybe head for Terrasin, push Adarlin out, and hold the line. We can't abandon Rifthold, Kael said, glancing at the prisoners being helped to their feet. It might be suicide to stay, Sen challenged. Some of the others nodded their agreement. Kael opened his mouth, but Nezrin said, We need to head for the river, fast. He gave her a grateful look, but she was already moving. Aelin waited until everyone was asleep and the full moon had risen before climbing out of bed, careful not to jostle Rowan. She slipped into the closet and dressed swiftly, strapping on the weapons she'd casually dumped there that afternoon. Neither male had commented when she'd plucked Damaris from the dining table, claiming she wanted to clean it. She strapped the ancient blade onto her back along with Goldrin, the two hilts peeking over either shoulder as she stood in front of the closet mirror and hastily braided back her hair. It was short enough now that braiding had become a nuisance, and the front bit slipped out, but at least it wasn't in her face. She crept from the closet, a spare cloak in hand, past the bed where Rowan's tattooed torso gleamed in the light of the full moon leaking in from the window. He didn't stir as she snuck from the bedroom and out of the apartment, no more than a shadow. Chapter 36 it didn't take long for Aelin to set her trap. She could feel the eyes monitoring her as she found the patrol led by one of the more sadistic Valg commanders. Thanks to Kael and Nezrin's reports, she knew their new hideouts. What Kael and Nezrin didn't know, what she had spent these nights sneaking out to track on her own, was which sewer entrances the commanders used when going to speak to one of the wordhounds. They seemed to prefer the most ancient waterways to swimming through the filth of the more recent main tunnels. She'd been getting as close as she dared, which usually was not near enough to overhear anything. Tonight she slipped down into one of the sewers after the commander, her steps nearly silent on the slick stones, trying to stifle her nausea at the stench. She'd waited until Kale, Nezrin, and their top lieutenants were out of the city, chasing down those prison wagons, if only so no one would get in her way again. She couldn't risk it. As she walked, keeping far enough behind the Valk commander that he wouldn't hear, she began speaking softly. I got the key, she said, a sigh of relief passing over her lips. Twisting her voice as Lysandra had showed her, she replied in a male tenor. You brought it with you? Of course I did. Now show me where you want me to hide it. Patience, she said, trying not to smile too much as she turned down a corner creeping along. It's just up this way. On she went, offering whispers of conversation until she neared the crossroads where the Val commanders liked to meet with their wordhounds overseer and fell silent. There, she dumped the spare cloak she'd brought and then backtracked to a ladder leading up the street. Aelin's breath caught as she pushed against the grate and it mercifully gave. She heaved herself onto the street, her hands unsteady. For a moment, she contemplating lying there on the filthy wet cobblestones, savoring the free air around her, but he was too close so she silently sealed the grate again. It took only a minute before near-silent boots scraped on stone below and a figure moved past the ladder, heading to where she'd left the cape, tracking her as he'd done all night. As she'd let him do all night. And when Lorcan walked right into the den of Valg commanders and the word hound that had come to retrieve their reports, when the clash of weapons and a roar of dying filled her ears, Aelin merely slaunted down the street, whistling to herself. 
Aelin was striding down an alley three blocks from the warehouse when a force akin to a stone wall slammed her face first into the side of a brick building. You little bitch, Lorcan snarled in her ear. Both of her arms were somehow already pinned behind her back, his legs digging hard enough into hers that she couldn't move them. Hello, Lorcan, she said sweetly, turning her throbbing face as much as she could. From the corner of her eye, she could make out cruel features beneath his dark hood, along with onyx eyes and matching shoulder-length hair, and damn, elongated canines shone far too near her throat. One hand gripped her arms like a steel vice. Lorcan used the other to push her head against the damp brick so hard her cheek scraped. You think that was funny? It was worth a shot, wasn't it? He reeked of blood, that awful otherworldly valg blood. He pushed her face a little harder into the wall, his body an immovable force against her. I'm going to kill you. Ah, uh, about that, she said, and shifted her wrist just enough for him to feel the blade she'd flicked free in the moment before she'd sensed his attack, the steel now resting against his groin. Immortality seems like a long, long time to go without your favorite body part. I'll rip out your throat before you can move. She pressed the blade harder against him. Big risk to take, isn't it? For a moment, Lorcan remained unmoving, still shoving her into the wall with the force of five centuries of lethal training. Then cool air nipped at her neck, her back. By the time she whirled, Lorcan was several paces away. In the darkness, she could barely make out the granite-hewn features, but she remembered enough from that day in Dornell to guess that beneath his hood, the unforgiving face was livid. Honestly, she said, leaning against the wall, I'm a little surprised you fell for it. You must think I'm truly stupid. Where's Rowan? He sneered. His close-fitting dark clothes armored with black metal at the forearms and shoulders seemed to gobble up the dim light. Still warming your bed? She didn't want to know how Lorcan knew that. Isn't that all you pretty males are good for? She looked him up and down, marking the many weapons both visible and concealed. Massive. As massive as Rowan and Adian. And utterly unimpressed by her. Did you kill all of them? There were only three by my count. There were six of them, and one of those stone demons, you bitch, and you knew it. So we had found a way to kill one of the wordhounds. Interesting, and good. You know, I'm really rather tired of being called that. You'd think five century would give you enough time to come up with something more creative. Come a little closer, and I'll show you just what five centuries can do. Why don't I show you what happens when you whip my friends, you spineless prick? Violence danced across those brutal features. Such a big mouth for someone without her fire tricks. Such a big mouth for someone who needs to mind his surroundings. Rowan's knife was angled along Lorcan's throat before he could so much as blink. She'd been wondering how long it would take for him to find her. He probably awakened the moment she pushed back the covers. Start talking, Rowan ordered Lorcan. Lorcan gripped his sword, a mighty, beautiful weapon that she had no doubt had ended many lives on killing fields in distant lands. You don't want to get into this fight right now. Give me a good reason not to spill your blood, Rowan said. If I die, Maeve will offer aid to the King of Adarlan against you. Bullshit, Aelin spat. Friends close, but enemies closer, right? Lorcan said. Slowly, Rowan let go of him and stepped away. All three of them monitored every movement the others made, until Rowan was at Aelin's side, his teeth bared at Lorcan. The aggression pouring off the Fae Prince was enough to make her jumpy. You made a fatal mistake, Lorcan said to her, the moment you showed my queen that vision of you with the key. He flicked his black eyes to Rowan. And you, you stupid fool, allying yourself, binding yourself to a mortal queen? What will you do, Rowan, when she grows old and dies? What about when she looks old enough to be your mother? Will you still share her bed? Still, that's enough, Rowan said softly. She didn't let one flicker of the emotions that shot through her show, didn't dare to even think about them for the fear Lorcan could smell them. Lorcan just laughed. You think you beat Maeve? She allowed you to walk out of Doranel, both of you. Aelin yawned. Honestly, Rowan, I don't know how you put up with him for so many centuries. Five minutes and I'm bored to tears. Watch yourself, girl, Lorcan said. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not in a week, but someday you will trip up and I will be waiting. Really, you fame males in your dramatic speeches. She turned to walk away, a move she could make only because of the prince standing between them. But she looked back over her shoulder, dropping all pretense of amusement, of boredom. Let that killing calm rise enough to the surface that she knew there was nothing human in her eyes as she said to Lorcan, I will never forget, not for one moment, what you did to him that day in Doranel. Your miserable existence is at the bottom of my priority list. But one day, Lorcan, she smiled a little. One day, I'll come to claim that debt too.
consider tonight a warning. Aelin had just unlocked the warehouse door when Rowan's deep voice purred from behind her. Busy night, princess? She hauled open the door and the two of them slipped into the near black warehouse illuminated only by a lantern near the back stairs. She took her time locking the sliding door behind her. Busy, but enjoyable. You're going to have to try a lot harder to sneak past me, Rowan said, the words laced with a growl. You and Adian are insufferable. Thank the gods Lorcan hadn't seen Adian, hadn't scented his heritage. I was perfectly safe. Lie. She hadn't been sure whether Lorcan would even show up or whether he would fall for her little trap. Rowan poked her cheek gently, and pain rippled. You're lucky scraping you is all he did. Next time you sneak out to pick a fight with Lorcan, you will tell me beforehand. I will do no such thing. It's my damn business, and it's not just your business. Not anymore. You will take me along with you the next time. The next time I sneak out, she seethed. If I catch you following me like some overprotective nursemaid, I will... You'll what? He stepped up close enough to share breath with her, his fangs flashing. In the light of the lantern, she could clearly see his eyes, and he could see hers as she silently said, I don't know what I'll do, you bastard, but I'll make your life a living hell for it. He snarled, and the sound stroked down her skin as she read the unspoken words in his eyes. Stop being stubborn. Is this some attempt to cling to your independence? And so what if it is? She shot back. Just let me do these things on my own. I can't promise that, he said, the dim light caressing his tan skin, the elegant tattoo. She punched him in the bicep, hurting herself more than him. Just because you're older and stronger doesn't mean you're entitled to order me around. It's exactly because of those things that I can do whatever I please. She let out a high-pitched sound and went to pinch his side, and he grabbed her hand, squeezing it tightly, dragging her a step closer to him. She tilted her head back to look at him. For a moment, Alone in that warehouse with nothing but the crates keeping them company, she allowed herself to take in his face, those green eyes, the strong jaw. Immortal, unyielding, blooded with power. Brute. Brat. She loosed a breathy laugh. Did you really lure Lorcan into a sewer with one of those creatures? It was such an easy trap that I'm actually disappointed he fell for it. Rowan chuckled. You never stop surprising me. He hurt you. I'm never going to forgive that. Plenty of people have hurt me. If you're going to go after every one, you'll have a busy life ahead of you. She didn't smile. What he said about me getting old? Don't. Just don't start with that. Go to sleep. What about you? He studied the warehouse door. I wouldn't put it past Lorcan to return the favor you dealt him tonight. He forgets and forgives even less easily than you do, especially when someone threatens to cut off his manhood. At least I said it would be a big mistake, she said with a fiendish grin. I was tempted to say little. Rowan laughed, his eyes dancing. Then you definitely would have been dead. Chapter 37 There were men screaming in the dungeons. He knew because the demon had forced him to take a walk there, past every cell and rack. He thought he might know some of the prisoners, but he couldn't remember their names. He could never remember their names when the man on the throne ordered the demon to watch their interrogation. The demon was happy to oblige, day after day after day. The king never asked them any questions. Some of the men cried, some screamed, and some stayed silent, defiant even. Yesterday, one of them, young, handsome, familiar, had recognized him and begged. He'd begged for mercy, insisted he knew nothing, and wept. But there was nothing he could do, even as he watched them suffer, even as the chambers filled with the reek of burning flesh and that coppery tang of blood. The demon savored it, growing stronger each day it went down there and breathed in their pain. He added their suffering to the memories that kept him company, and let the demon take him back to those dungeons of agony and despair the next day and the next. Chapter 38 Aelin didn't dare go back to the sewers, not until she was certain Lorcan was out of the area and the Valg weren't lurking about. The next night, they were all eating a dinner Adian had scraped together from whatever was lying around the kitchen when the front door opened and Lysander breezed in with a chirped hello that had them all releasing the weapons they'd grabbed. How do you do that? Adian demanded as she paraded into the kitchen. What a miserable looking meal, was all Lysander said, peering over Adian's shoulder at the spread of bread, pickled vegetables, cold eggs, fruit, dried meat, and leftover breakfast pastries. Can't any of you cook? Aelin, who had been swiping grapes off Rowan's plate, snorted. Breakfast, it seems, is the only meal any of us are decent at. And this one, she jabbed a thumb in Rowan's direction, only knows how to cook meat on a stick over a fire. 
Lysandra nudged Aelin down the bench and squeezed onto the end, her blue dress like liquid silk as she reached for some bread. Pathetic. Utterly pathetic for such esteemed and mighty leaders. Adian braced his arm on the table. Make yourself at home, why don't you? Lysandra kissed the air between them. Hello, General. Good to see you're looking well. Aelin would have been content to sit back and watch, until Lysandra turned those uptilted eyes towards Rowan. I don't think we were introduced the other day. Her queenliness had something rather urgent to tell me. A sly cat's glance in Aelin's direction. Rowan, seated on Adian's right, cocked his head to the side. Do you need an introduction? Lysandra's smile grew. I like your fangs, she said sweetly. Aelin choked on her grape. Of course Lysandra did. Rowan gave a little grin that usually sent Aelin running. Are you setting them so you can replicate them when you take my form, shapeshifter? Aelin's fork froze in midair. Bullshit, Adian said. All amusement had vanished from the courtesan's face. Shapeshifter. Holy gods. What was fire magic or wind and ice compared to shapeshifting? Shifters, spies and thieves and assassins able to demand any price for their services. The bane of courts across the world, so feared that they'd been hunted nearly to extinction even before a darlin had banned magic. Lysander plucked up a grape, examined it, and then flicked her eyes to Rowan. Perhaps I'm just studying you to know where to sink my fangs if I ever get my gifts back. Rowan laughed. It explained so much. You and I are nothing but beasts wearing human skins. Lysander turned her attention to Aelin. No one knows this, not even Arabin. Her face was hard. A challenge and a question lay in those eyes. Secrets. Nehemia had kept secrets from her, too. Aelin didn't say anything. Lysander's mouth tightened as she turned to Rowan. How'd you know? A shrug, even as Aelin felt his attention on her and knew he could read the emotions biting at her. I met a few shifters, centuries ago. Your sense are the same. Lysandra sniffed at herself, but Adian murmured, So that's what it is. Lysandra looked at Aelin again. Say something. Aelin held up a hand. Just, just give me a moment. A moment to sort out one friend from another. The friends she had loved and who had lied to her at every chance, and the friends she had hated and who she had kept secrets from herself. Hated, until love and hate had met in the middle, fused by loss. Adian asked, How old were you when you found out? Young. Five or six. I knew even then to hide it from everyone. It wasn't my mother, so my father must have given the gift. She'd never mentioned him, or seemed to miss him. Gift. Interesting choice of words. Rowan said, What happened to her? Lysandra shrugged. I don't know. I was seven when she beat me and then threw me out of the house. Because we lived here, in this city, and that morning, for the first time, I'd made the mistake of shifting in her presence. I don't remember why, but I remember being startled enough that I changed into a hissing tabby right in front of her. Shit, Adian said. So you're a full-powered shifter, Rowan said. I'd known what I was for a long time. From even before that moment, I knew I could change into any creature. But magic was outlawed here, and everyone, in every kingdom, was distrustful of shapeshifters. How could they not be? A low laugh. After she kicked me out, I was left on the streets. We were poor enough that it was hardly different, but I spent the first few days crying on the doorstep. She threatened to turn me into the authorities, so I ran, and I never saw her again. I even went back to the house months later, but she was gone, moved away. She sounds like a wonderful person, Adian said. Lysandra hadn't lied to her. Nehemia had lied outright, kept things that were vital. What Lysandra was, they were even. After all, she hadn't told Lysandra she was queen. How do you survive? Aelin asked at last, her shoulders relaxing. A seven-year-old in the streets of Rifthold doesn't often meet a happy end. Something sparked in Lysander's eyes, and Aelin wondered if she had been waiting for the blow to fall, waiting for the order to get out. I used my abilities. Sometimes I was human. Sometimes I wore the skins of other street children with high standing in their packs. Sometimes I became an alley cat or a rat or a gull. And then I learned that if I made myself prettier, if I made myself beautiful, when I begged for money, it came far faster. I was wearing one of those beautiful faces the day magic fell, and I've been stuck in it ever since. So this face, Aelin said, isn't your real face? Your real body? No. And what kills me is that I can't remember what my face was. That was the danger of shifting, that you would forget your real form, because it's the memory of it that guides the shifting. I remember being plain as a dormouse, but... I don't remember if my eyes were blue or gray or green. I can't remember the shape of my nose or my chin. And it was a child's body, too. I don't know what I would look like now, as a woman. 
Aelin said, and this was the form that Arabin spotted you in a few years later. Lysandra nodded and picked out an invisible fleck of lint on her dress. If magic is free again, would you be wary of a shapeshifter? So carefully phrased, so casually asked, as if it weren't the most important question of all. Aelin shrugged and gave her the truth. I'd be jealous of a shapeshifter. Shifting into any form I please would come in rather handy. She considered it. A shapeshifter would make a powerful ally, and an even more entertaining friend. Adian mused. It would make a difference on a battlefield once magic is freed. Rowan just asked, Did you have a favorite form? Lysander's grin was nothing short of wicked. I liked anything with claws and big, big fangs. Aelin swallowed her laugh. Is there a reason behind this visit, Lysandra, or are you just here to make my friends squirm? All amusement faded as Lysandra held up a velvet sack that sagged with what looked to be a large box. What you requested? The box thumped as she set the sack onto the worn wooden table. Aelin slid the sack toward herself, even as the males raised their brows and subtly sniffed at the box within. Thank you. Lysandra said, Arabin is going to call on your favor tomorrow, to be delivered the following night. Be ready. Good. It was an effort to keep her face blank. Adian leaned forward, glancing between them. Does he expect only Aelin to deliver it? No, all of you, I think, Rowan said. Is it a trap? Probably in some way or another, Lysander said. He wants you to deliver it and then join him for dinner. Demons and dining, Aelin said. A delightful combination. Only Lysander smiled. Will he poison us? Adian asked. Aelin scratched at a piece of dirt on the table. Poison is an Arab in style. If he were to do anything to the food, it would be to add some drug that would incapacitate us while he had us moved wherever he wanted. It's the control that he loves, she added, still staring at the table, not quite feeling like seeing what was written on Rowan or Adian's face. The pain and fear, yes, but the power is what he really thrives on. Lysandra's face had lost its softness, her eyes cold and sharp, a reflection of Aelin's own, no doubt. The only person who could understand, who had also learned firsthand exactly how far that lust for control went. Aelin rose from her seat. I'll walk you to your carriage. She and Lysandra paused among the stacks of crates in the warehouse. Are you ready? Lysandra asked, crossing her arms. Aelin nodded. I'm not sure the debt could ever be paid for what, what they all did, but it will have to be enough. I'm running out of time. Lysandra pursed her lips. I won't be able to risk coming here again until afterward. Thank you. For everything. He could still have a few tricks up his sleeve. Be on your guard. And you be on yours. You're not mad that I didn't tell you? Your secret could get you killed just as easily as mine, Lysandra. I just felt... I don't know. If anything, I'd wondered if I'd done something wrong. Something to make you not trust me enough to tell me. I wanted to. I've been dying to. Aelin believed her. You risked those Val guards for me, for Adian that day we rescued him, Aelin said. They'd probably be beside themselves if they learned there was a shifter in this city. And that night at the pits, when she'd kept turning away from the Valg and hiding behind Arobin, it had been to avoid their notice. You have to be insane. Even before I knew who you were, Aelin, I knew that what you were working toward, it was worth it. What is? Her throat tightened. A world where people like me don't have to hide. Lysandra turned away, but Aelin grabbed her by the hand. Lysandra smiled a bit. Times like these, I wish I had your particular skill set instead. Would you do it if you could? About two nights from now, I mean. Lysandra gently let go of her hand. I've thought about it every single day since Wesley died. I would do it, and gladly. But I don't mind if you do it. You won't hesitate. I find that comforting somehow. The invitation arrived by street urchin at 10 o'clock the next morning. Aelin stared at the cream-colored envelope on the table before the fireplace, its red wax seal imprinted with crossed daggers. Adian and Rowan, peering over her shoulders, studied the box it had come with. Both males sniffed and frowned. It smells like almonds, Adian said. She pulled out the card. A formal invitation for dinner tomorrow at 8, for her and two guests, and a request for the favor owed to him. His patience was at an end, but in typical Arabin fashion, dumping the demon at his doorstep wouldn't be enough. No, she'd deliver it on his terms. The dinner was late enough in the day to give her time to stew. There was a note at the end of the invitation, in an elegant yet efficient scrawl. A gift, and one I hope you'll wear tomorrow night. 
She chucked the card onto the table and waved a hand to Adian or Rowan to open the box as she walked to the window and looked out toward the castle. It was blindingly bright in the morning sun, glimmering as though it had been crafted from pearl and gold and silver. The slither of ribbon, the thud of a box lid opening, and what the hell is that? She glanced over her shoulder. Adian held a large glass bottle in his hands, full of amber liquid. She said flatly, Perfumed skin oil. Why does he want you to wear it? Adian asked too quietly. She looked out the window again. Rowan stalked over and perched on the armchair behind her, a steady force at her back. Aelin said, It's just another move in the game we've been playing. She'd have to rub it into her skin. His scent. She told herself she'd expected nothing less, but... And you're going to use it? Adian spat. Tomorrow, our one goal is to get the amulet of Orinth from him. Agreeing to wear that oil will put him in an unsure footing. I don't follow. The invitation is a threat, Rowan replied for her. She could feel him inches away, was aware of his movements as much as her own. Two companions. He knows how many of us are here, knows who you are. And you? Adian asked. The fabric of his shirt sighed against Rowan's skin as he shrugged. He's probably figured out by now that I'm Fay. The thought of Rowan facing Arabin, and what Arabin might try to do. And what about the demon? Adian demanded. He expects us to bring it over in all our finery? Another test. And yes. So when do we go catch ourselves a Valg commander? Aelin and Rowan glanced at each other. You're staying here, she said to Adian. Like hell I am. She pointed to his side. If you hadn't been a hot-headed pain in my ass and torn your stitches when you sparred with Rowan, you could have come. But you're still on the mend, and I'm not going to risk exposing your wounds to the filth and the sewers just so you can feel better about yourself. Adian's nostrils flared as he reined in his temper. You're going to face a demon. She'll be taken care of, Rowan said. I can take care of myself, she snapped. I'm going to get dressed. She grabbed her suit from where she'd left it drying over an armchair before the open windows. Adian sighed behind her. Please, just be safe. And Lysandra is to be trusted? We'll find out tomorrow, she said. She trusted Lysandra. She wouldn't have let her near Adian otherwise. But Lysandra wouldn't necessarily know if Arabin was using her. Rowan lifted his brows. Are you all right? She nodded. I just want to get through these two days and be done with it. That will never stop being strange, Adian muttered. Deal with it, she told him, carrying the suit into the bedroom. Let's go hunt ourselves a pretty little demon. Chapter 39 Dead as can be, Aelin said, towing the upper half of the wordhound's remains. Rowan, crouching over one of the bottom bits, growled his confirmation. Lorcan doesn't pull punches, does he? She said, studying the reeking blood-splattered sewer crossroads. There was hardly anything left of the Valg captains, or the word hound. In a matter of moments, Lorcan had massacred them all as if they were chattel. Gods above. Lorcan probably spent the entire fight imagining one of these creatures was you, Rowan said, rising from his crouch bearing a clawed arm. The stone skin seems like armor, but inside it's just flesh. He sniffed at it and snarled in disgust. Good. And thank you, Lorcan, for finding that out for us. She strode to Rowan, taking the heavy arm from him and waved at the prince with the creature's stiff fingers. Stop that, he hissed. She wriggled the demon's fingers a bit more. It'd make a good back scratcher. Rowan only frowned. Killjoy, she said, and chucked the arm onto the torso of the word hound. It landed with a heavy thump and a click of stone. So, Lorcan can bring down a word hound. Rowan snorted at the name she'd coined. And once it's down, it seems like it stays down. Good to know. Rowan eyed her warily. This trap wasn't just to send Lorcan a message, was it? These things are the king's puppets, she said, so his grand imperial majesty now has a read on Lorcan's face and smell, and I suspect he will not be very pleased to have a fey warrior in his city. Why, I'd bet that Lorcan is currently being pursued by the seven other word hounds, who no doubt have a score to settle on behalf of their king and their fallen brother. Rowan shook his head. I don't know whether to throttle you or to clap you on the back. I think there's a long line of people who feel the same way. She scanned the sewer turned Charnel house. I needed Lorcan's eyes everywhere tonight and tomorrow, and I needed to know whether these word hounds could be killed. Why? He saw too much. Slowly, she met his gaze, because I'm going to use their beloved sewer entrance to get into the castle and blow up the clock tower from right under them. Rowan let out a low, wicked chuckle. That's how you're going to free magic. Once Lorcan kills the last of the word hounds, you're going in. 
He really should have killed me, considering the world of trouble that's now hunting him through the city. Rowan bared his teeth in a feral smile. He had it coming. Cloaked, armed, and masked, Aelin leaned against the stone wall of the abandoned building while Rowan circled the bound Valg commander in the center of the room. You've signed your death warrants, you maggots, the thing inside the guard's body said. Aelin clicked her tongue. You must not be very good demon to be captured so easily. It had been a joke, really. Aelin had picked the smallest patrol led by the mildest of the commanders. She and Rowan had ambushed the patrol just before midnight in a quiet part of the city. She'd barely killed two guards before the rest were dead, at Rowan's hand, and when the commander tried to run, the fey warrior had caught him within heartbeats. Rendering him unconscious had been the work of a moment. The hardest part had been dragging his carcass across the slums, into the building, and down into the cellar where they chained him to a chair. I'm not a demon, the man hissed, as if every word burned him. Aelin crossed her arms. Rowan, bearing both Goldrin and Damaris, circled the man, a hawk closing in on his prey. Then what's the ring for? She said, a gasp of breath, human, labored, to enslave us, corrupt us, and come closer and I might tell you. His voice changed then, deeper and colder. What's your name? Rowan asked. Your human tongues cannot pronounce our names or our language, the demon said. She mimicked. Your human tongues cannot pronounce our names. I've heard that one before, unfortunately. Aelin let out a low laugh as the creature inside the man seethed. What is your name? Your real name. The man thrashed, a violent jerking motion that made Rowan step closer. She carefully monitored the battle between the two beings inside that body, and at last, it said, Steven. Steven, she said. The man's eyes were clear, fixed on her. Steven, she said again, louder. Quiet, the demon snapped. Where are you from, Steven? Enough of Melisande. Steven, she repeated. It hadn't worked on the day of Adian's escape. It hadn't been enough then, but now. Do you have a family, Steven? Dead, all of them, just as you will be. He stiffened, slumped, stiffened, slumped. Can you take off the ring? Never, the thing said. Can you come back, Steven, if the ring is gone? A shudder that left his head hanging between his shoulders. I don't want to, even if I could. Why? The things, things I did, we did. He liked to watch while I took them, while I ripped them apart. Rowan stopped his circling, standing beside her. Despite his mask, she could almost see the look on his face, the disgust and pity. Tell me about the Valg princes, Aelin said. Both man and demon were silent. Tell me about the Valg princes, she ordered. They are darkness, they are glory, they are eternal. Steven, tell me, is there one here in Rifthold? Yes. Whose body is it inhabiting? The crown princes. Is the prince in there, as you are in there? I never saw him, never spoke to him. If, if it's a prince inside him, I... Can't hold out, can't stand this thing. If it's a prince, the prince will have broken him, used and taken him. Dorian, Dorian. The man breathed, please. His voice so empty and soft compared to that thing inside of him. Please, just end it. I can't hold it. Liar, she purred. You gave yourself to it. No choice, the man gasped out. They came to our homes, our families. They said the rings were part of the uniform, so we had to wear them. A shudder went through him, and something ancient and cold smiled at her. What are you, woman? It licked its lips. Let me taste you. Tell me what you are. Aelin studied the black ring on his finger. Cain, once upon a time, months and lifetimes ago, Cain had fought the thing inside of him. There had been a day in the halls of the castle when he looked hounded, hunted, as if... Despite the ring, I am death, she said simply. Should you want it? The man sagged, the demon vanishing. Yes, he sighed. Yes. What would you offer me in exchange? Anything, the man breathed. Please. She looked at his hand, at his ring, and reached into her pocket. Then listen carefully. Aelin awoke, drenched in sweat, and twisted in the sheets, fear clenching her like a fist. She willed herself to breathe, to blink, to look at the moon-bathed room, and to turn her head to see the fey prince slumbering across the bed. Alive, not tortured, not dead. Still, she reached out a hand over the sea of blankets between them and touched his bare shoulder. 
rock-hard muscle encased in velvet-soft skin. Real. They'd done what they needed to, and the Valk commander was locked in another building, ready and waiting for tomorrow night, when they would bring him to the keep, Arabin's favor at last fulfilled. But the words of the demon rang through her head, and then they blended with the voice of the Valk prince that had used Dorian's mouth like a puppet. I will destroy everything you love. A promise. Aelin loosed a breath, careful not to disturb the fey prince sleeping beside her. For a moment, it was hard to pull back the hand touching his arm. For a moment, she was tempted to stroke her fingers down the curve of muscle. But she had one less thing to do tonight, so she withdrew her hand. And this time, he didn't wake when she crept out of the room. It was almost four in the morning when she slipped back into the bedroom, her boots clutched in one hand. She made it all of two steps, two immensely heavy, exhausted steps, before Rowan said from the bed, You smell like ash. She just kept going, until she'd dropped her boots off in the closet, stripped down into the first shirt she could find, and washed her face and neck. I had things to do, she said as she climbed into bed. You were stealthier this time. The rage simmering off of him was almost hot enough to burn through the blankets. This wasn't particularly high risk. Lie. Lie, lie, lie. She'd just been lucky. And I suppose you're not going to tell me until you want to? She slumped against the pillows. Don't get pissy because I outstealth you. His snarl reverberated across the mattress. It's not a joke. She closed her eyes, her limbs leaden. I know. Aelin... She was already asleep. Rowan wasn't pissy. No, pissy didn't cover a fraction of it. The rage was still riding him the next morning, when he awoke before she did and slipped into her closet to examine the clothes she'd shucked off. Dust and metal and smoke and sweat tickled his nose, and there were streaks of dirt and ash on the black cloth. Only a few daggers lay scattered nearby, no sign of Goldrin or Damaris having been moved from where he'd dumped them on the closet floor last night, no whiff of Lorcan or the Valg, no scent of blood. Either she hadn't wanted to risk losing the ancient blades in a fight, or she hadn't wanted the extra weight. She was sprawled across the bed when he emerged, his jaw clenched. She hadn't even bothered to wear one of those ridiculous nightgowns. She must have been exhausted enough not to bother with anything other than that oversized shirt. His shirt, he noticed with no small amount of male satisfaction. It was enormous on her. It was so easy to forget how much smaller she was than him, how mortal, and how utterly unaware of the control he had to exercise every day, every hour, to keep her at arm's length, to keep from touching her. He glowered at her before striding out of the bedroom. In the mountains, he would have made her go on a run, or chop wood for hours, or pull extra kitchen duty. This apartment was too small, too full of males used to getting their own way, and a queen used to getting hers. Worse, a queen hell-bent on keeping secrets. He'd dealt with young rulers before. Maeve had dispatched him to enough foreign courts that he knew how to get them to heal. But Aelin? She'd taken him out to hunt demons, and yet this task, whatever she had done, required him to even be kept in ignorance. Rowan filled the kettle, focusing on each movement, if only to keep from throwing it through the window. Making breakfast? How domestic of you. Aelin leaned against the doorway, as irreverent as always. Shouldn't you be sleeping like the dead, considering your busy night? Can we not get into a fight about it before my first cup of tea? With lethal calm, he set the kettle on the stove. After tea, then? She crossed her arms, sunlight kissing the shoulder of her pale blue robe. Such a creature of luxury, his queen. And yet, yet she hadn't bought a single new thing for herself lately. She loosed a breath and her shoulders slumped a bit. His rage roaring through his veins stumbled, and stumbled again when she chewed on her lip. I need you to come with me today. Anywhere you need to go, he said. She looked toward the table at the stove. To Arabin? He hadn't forgotten for one second where they would be going tonight, what she would be facing. She shook her head, then shrugged. No, I mean, yes, I want you to come tonight, but... There's something else I need to do, and I want to do it today, before everything happens. He waited, restraining himself from going to her, from asking her to tell him more. That had been their promise to each other, space to sort out their own miserable lives, to sort out how to share them. He didn't mind, most of the time. She rubbed at her brows with her thumb and forefinger, and when she squared her shoulders, those silk-clad shoulders that bore a weight he'd do anything to relieve, she lifted her chin. There's a grave I need to visit. She didn't have a black gown fit for mourning, but Aelin figured Sam would have preferred to see her in something bright and lovely anyway, so she wore a tunic the color of spring grass, its sleeves capped with dusty golden velvet cuffs. 
life, she thought, as she strode through the small, pretty graveyard overlooking the Avery. The clothes Sam would have wanted her to wear reminded her of life. The graveyard was empty, but the headstones and grass were well kept, and the towering oaks were budding with new leaves. A breeze coming in off the glimmering river was setting them sighing and ruffled her unbound hair, which was now back to its normal honey gold. Rowan had stayed near the little iron gate, leaning against one of those oaks to keep passerbys on the quiet city street behind them from noticing him. If they did, his black clothes and weapons painted him as a mere bodyguard. She had planned to come alone, but this morning she'd awoken and just needed him with her. The new grass cushioned each step between the pale headstone, bathed in the sunlight streaming down. She picked up pebbles along the way, discarding the misshapen and rough ones, keeping those that gleamed with bits of quartz or color. She clutched a fistful of them by the time she approached the last line of graves at the edge of the large muddy river flowing lazily past. It was a lovely grave, simple, clean, and on the stone was written, Sam Cortland, Beloved. Arabin had left it blank, unmarked, but Wesley had explained in his letter how he'd asked the tombstone carver to come. She approached the grave, reading it over and over. Beloved, not just by her, but by many. Sam, her Sam. For a moment, she stared at that stretch of grass, at the white stone. For a moment, she could see that beautiful face grinning at her, yelling at her, loving her. She opened her fist of pebbles and picked out the three loveliest. Two for the years since he'd been taken from her, one for what they'd been together. Carefully, she placed them at the apex of the headstone's curve. Then she sat down against the stone, tucking her feet beneath her, and rested her head against the smooth, cool rock. Hello, Sam, she breathed under the river breeze. She said nothing for a time, content to be near him, even in this form. The sun warmed her hair, a kiss of heat along her scalp, a trace of mala, perhaps, even here. She began talking, quietly and succinctly, telling Sam about what had happened to her ten years ago, telling him about the past nine months. When she was done, she stared up at the oak leaves rustling overhead and dragged her fingers through the soft grass. I miss you, she said. Every day I miss you, and I wonder what you would have made of all this, made of me. I think, I think you would have been a wonderful king. I think they would have liked you more than me, actually, her throat tightened. I never told you how I felt. But I loved you, and I think that a part of me might always love you. Maybe you were my mate, and I never knew it. Maybe I'll spend the rest of my life wondering about that. Maybe I'll see you again in the afterworld, and then I'll know for sure. But until then, until then I'll miss you, and I'll wish you were here. She would not apologize, nor say it was her fault, because his death wasn't her fault, and tonight, tonight she would settle that debt. She wiped at her face with the back of her sleeve and got to her feet. The sun dried her tears. She smelled the pine and snow before she heard him, and when she turned, Rowan stood a few feet away, staring at the headstone behind her. He was... I know who he was to you, Rowan said softly, and held out his hand, not to take hers, but for a stone. She opened her fist, and he sorted through the pebbles until he found one, smooth and round, the size of a hummingbird's egg. With a gentleness that cracked her heart, he set it on the headstone beside her own pebbles. You're going to kill Arabin tonight, aren't you? He said. After the dinner, when he's gone to bed, I'm going back to the keep and ending it. She'd come here to remind herself. Remind herself why that grave before them existed, and why she had those scars on her back. And the amulet of Orinth? An end game, but also a distraction. The sunlight danced on the Avery, nearly blinding. You're ready to do it? She looked back to the gravestone, and at the grass concealing the coffin beneath. I have no choice but to be ready. Chapter 40 Elide spent two days on voluntary kitchen duty, learning where and when the laundresses ate and who brought their food. By that point, the head cook trusted her enough that when she volunteered to bring the bread up to the dining hall, he didn't think twice. No one noticed when she sprinkled the poison onto a few rolls of bread. The wing leader had sworn it wouldn't kill, just make the laundress sick for a few days. And maybe it made her selfish for placing her own survival first, but Elide didn't hesitate as she dumped the pale powder onto some of the rolls, blending it into the flour that dusted them. Elide marked one roll in particular to make sure she gave it to the laundress she'd noted days before, but the others would be given out at random to the other laundresses. Hell, she was likely going to burn in Hela's realm forever for this. But she could think about her damnation when she had escaped and was far, far away beyond the southern continent. Elide limped into the raucous dining hall, a quiet cripple with yet another platter of food. 
She made her way down the long table, trying to keep the weight off her leg as she leaned in again and again to deposit the rolls onto plates. The laundress didn't even bother to thank her. The next day, the keep was abuzz with the news that the third of the laundresses were sick. It must have been the chicken at dinner, they said, or the mutton, or the soup, since only some of them had had it. The cook apologized, and Alid had tried not to apologize to him when he, she saw the terror in his eyes. The head laundress actually looked relieved when Alid limped in to volunteer and help. She told her to pick any station and get to work. Perfect. But guilt pushed down on her shoulders as she went right to that woman's station. She worked all day and waited for the bloody clothes to arrive. When they finally did, there was not as much blood as before, but more of a substance that looked like vomit. Elite almost vomited herself when she washed them all, and wrung them out, and dried them, and pressed them. It took hours. Night was falling when she folded the last of them, trying to keep her fingers from shaking. But she went up to the head laundress and said softly, no more than a nervous girl, should, should I bring them back? The woman smirked. Elite wondered if the other laundress had been sent down there as punishment. There's a stairwell over by that wall to take you all the way to the subterranean levels. Tell the guards you're Misty's replacement. Bring the clothes to the second door on the left and drop them outside. The woman looked at Elide's changed. Try not to run out, if you can. Elide's bowels had turned to water by the time she reached the guards. But they didn't so much as question her as she recited what the head laundress had said. Down, down, down she walked, into the gloom of the spiral stairwell. The temperature plummeted the farther she descended. And then she heard the moaning. Moans of pain, of terror, of despair. She held the basket of clothes to her chest. A torch flickered ahead. Gods, it was so cold here. The stairs widened toward the bottom, flaring out into a straight descent that revealed a broad hallway, lit with torches and lined with countless iron doors. The moans were coming from behind them. Second door on the left. It was gouged with what looked like a claw mark, pushing out from within. There were guards down here. Guards and strange men patrolling up and down, opening and closing the doors. Elide's knees wobbled. No one stopped her. She set the basket of laundry in front of the second door and rapped quietly. The iron was so cold that it burned. Clean clothes, she said against the metal. It was absurd. In this place, with these people, they still insisted on clean clothes. Three of the guards had paused to watch. She pretended not to notice, pretended to back away slowly, a scared little rabbit pretended to catch her mangled foot on something and slip. But it was real pain that roared through her leg as she went down, her chain snapping and tugging at her. The floor was cold as the iron door. None of the guards made to help her up. She hissed, clutching her ankle, buying as much time as she could, her heart thundering, 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 and then the door cracked open. Manon watched Alid vomit again, and again. A black beak sentinel had found her curled in a ball in a corner of a random hallway, shaking a puddle of piss beneath her. Having heard that the servant was now Manon's property, the sentinel had dragged her up here. Astrin and Sorrel stood stone-faced behind Manon as the girl puked into the bucket again, only bile and spittle this time, and at last raised her head. Report, Manon said. I saw the chamber, Elid rasped. They all went still. Something opened the door to take the laundry, and I saw the chamber beyond. With those keen eyes of hers, she'd likely seen too much. Out with it, Manon said, leaning against the bedpost. Astrin and Sorrel lingered by the door, monitoring for eavesdroppers. Elide stayed on the floor, her leg twisted out to the side, but the eyes that met Manon sparked with the fiery temper that the girl rarely revealed. The thing that opened the door was a beautiful man, a man with golden hair and a collar around his neck, but he was not a man. There was nothing human in those eyes. One of the princes. It had to be. I, I pretended I'd fallen so I could buy myself more time to see who opened the door. When he saw me on the ground, he smiled at me, and this darkness leaked out of him. She lurched toward the bucket and leaned over it, but didn't vomit. After another moment, she said, I managed to look past him into the room beyond. She stared at Manon, then at Astrin and Sorrel. You said they were to be implanted. Yes, Manon said. Did you know how many times? What? Astrin breathed. Did you know, Elide said, her voice uneven with rage or fear, how many times they were each to be implanted with offspring before they were let go? Everything went quiet in Manon's head. Go on. Elide's face was white as death making her freckles look like dried, splattered blood. 
From what I saw, they've delivered at least one baby each and are already about to give birth to another. That's impossible, Sorrel said. The witchlings? Astrin breathed. Elid really did vomit again this time. When she was done, Manon mastered herself enough to say, Tell me about the witchlings. They are not witchlings. They are not babies, Elid spat, covering her face with her hands as if to rip out her eyes. They are creatures. They are demons. Their skin is like black diamond, and they, they have these snouts with teeth, fangs. Already they have fangs, and not like yours. She lowered her hands. They have teeth of black stone. There is nothing of you in them. If Sorrel and Astrin were horrified, they showed nothing. What of the yellow legs? Manon demanded. They have them chained to tables, altars, and they were sobbing. They were begging the man to let them go, but they're, they're so close to giving birth, and then I ran. I ran from there as fast as I could, and oh gods, oh gods, Elise began weeping. Slowly, slowly, Manon turned to her second and third. Sorrel was pale, her eyes raging. But Astrin met Manon's gaze, met it with a fury that Manon had never seen directed at her. You let them do this. Manon's nails flicked out. These are my orders. This is our task. It is an abomination, Astrin shouted. Elid paused her weeping and backed away to the safety of the fireplace. Then there were tears, tears in Astrin's eyes. Manon snarled. Has your heart softened? The voice might as well have been her grandmother's. Do you have no stomach for- You let them do this! Astrin bellowed. Sorrel got right in Astrin's face. Stand down! Astrin shoved Sorrel away so violently that Manon's second went crashing into the dresser. Before Sorrel could recover, Astrin was inches from Manon. You gave him those witches! You gave him witches! Manon lashed out, her hand wrapping around Astrin's throat. But Astrin gripped her arm, digging her iron nails so hard that blood ran. For a moment, Manon's blood dripping on the floor was the only sound. Astrin's life should have been forfeited for drawing blood from the air. Light glinted off Sorrel's dagger as she approached, ready to tear into Astrin's spine if Manon gave the order. Manon could have sworn Sorrel's hand wobbled slightly. Manon met Astrin's gold-flecked black eyes. You do not question. You do not demand. You are no longer third. Vesta will replace you. You... A harsh, broken laugh. You're not going to do anything about it, are you? You're not going to free them. You're not going to fight for them. For us. Because what would Grandmother say? Why hasn't she answered your letters, Manon? How many have you sent now? Astrin's iron nails dug in deeper, shredding flesh. Manon embraced the pain. Tomorrow morning at breakfast, you will receive your punishment, Manon hissed, and shoved her third away, sending Astrin staggering toward the door. Manon let her bloodied arm hang at her side. She'd need to bind it up soon. The blood, on her palm and on her fingers, felt so familiar. If you try to free them, if you do anything stupid, Astrin Blackbeak, Manon went on, the next punishment you'll receive will be your own execution. Astrin let out another joyless laugh. You would not have disobeyed even if it had been Blackbeaks down there, would you? Loyalty, obedience, brutality, that is what you are. Leave while you can still walk, Sorrel said softly. Astrin whirled toward the second and something like hurt flashed across her face. Manon blinked. Those feelings. Astrin turned on her heel and left, slamming the door behind her. Elide had managed to clear her head by the time she offered to clean and bandage Manon's arm. What she'd seen today, both in this room and in that chamber below. You let them do this. She didn't blame Astrin for it, even if it had shocked her to see the witch lose control so completely. She had never seen any of them react with anything but cool amusement, indifference, or raging bloodlust. Manon hadn't said a word since she'd ordered Sorrel away to follow Astrin and keep her from doing something profoundly stupid. As if saving those yellow leg witches might be foolish, as if that sort of mercy was reckless. Manon was staring at nothing as Elide finished applying the salve and reached for the bandages. The puncture wounds were deep, but not bad enough to warrant stitches. Is your broken kingdom worth it? Elide dared to ask. Those burnt gold eyes shifted toward the darkened window. I do not expect a human to understand what it is like to be an immortal with no homeland, to be cursed with eternal exile. Cold, distant words. Elid said, My kingdom was conquered by the king of Adarlan, and everyone I loved was executed. My father's lands, my title, were stolen from me by my uncle, and my best chance of safety now lies in sailing into the other side of the world. I understand what it is like to wish, to hope. It is not hope. It is survival. 
Elid gently rolled a bandage around the witch's forearm. It is hope for your homeland that guides you, that makes you obey. And what of your future? For all your talk of hope, you seem resigned to fleeing. Why not return to your kingdom, to fight? Perhaps the horror she'd witnessed today gave her the courage to say, Ten years ago, my parents were murdered. My father was executed on a butchering block in front of thousands. But my mother... My mother died defending Aelin Galathinius, the heir to the throne of Terrasin. She bought Aelin time to run. They followed Aelin's track down to the frozen river where they said she must have fallen in and drowned. But you see, Aelin had fire magic. She could have survived the cold. And Aelin... Aelin really never liked me or played with me because I was so shy, but... I never believed them when they said she was dead. Every day since then, I've told myself that she got away and that she's still out there biding her time. Growing up, growing strong, so that she might one day come to save Terrison. And you are my enemy, because if she returns, she will fight you. But for ten years, until I came here, I endured Vernon because of her, because of the hope that she got away and my mother's sacrifice wasn't in vain. I thought that one day, Aelin would come to save me, would remember I existed and rescued me from that tower. There it was, her great secret, which she had never dared tell anyone, even her nursemaid. Even though she never came, even though I'm here now, I can't let go of that. And I think that is why you obey, because you have been hoping every day of your miserable, hideous life that you'll get to go home. Elid finished wrapping the bandage and stepped back. Manon was staring at her now. If this Aelin Galathinius were indeed alive, would you try to run to her? Fight with her? I would fight with tooth and claw to get to her. But there are lines I would not cross, because I don't think I could face her if... if I couldn't face myself for what I'd done. Manon said nothing. Elid stepped away, heading to the bathing room to wash her hands. The wing leader said from behind her, Do you believe monsters are born or made? From what she'd seen today, she would say some creatures were very much born evil. But what Manon was asking? I'm not the one who needs to answer that question, Elid said.